Hello everyone, welcome back. I am really excited because we're gonna be doing something a little bit new today. We are going to be going on a deep dive. That's right, we are just going to be digging into this topic. Now I'm gonna try and go slow and take you with me every step of the way, but this is gonna be a little bit more in depth than some of my past videos. I'm super excited and it's a topic that I'm really passionate about and I think it's super interesting and I hope you will too, and that is the Oort cloud. So we're going to talk about what the Oort cloud is, what it looks like, how it formed Oort clouds in other systems, and there is going to be one equation on the screen at some point, but you won't have to do any math, I promise. So let's go. Okay, so what even is the Oort cloud? Well, it's a cloud of Oorts. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, that was such a bad joke, <laughs> but I'm going to keep it. It's actually a cloud of comets, and the cloud is named after the Dutch astronomer Jan Oort. Now these comets are part of the solar system, but they are super distant from the sun. I'm talking about 2000 AU out to almost 100,000 AU. Remember, an AU is the distance between the sun and the earth, so we're talking way, way out there. And unlike most of the rest of the solar system, which is basically confined to a disk, the Oort cloud is actually roughly spherical, at least in the outer regions. Now you could consider the Oort cloud to be kind of the edge of the solar system. It certainly marks the edge of the sun's hill sphere, which is the region in space where the gravity is dominated by the sun rather than any other gravitational sources. However, often the edge of the solar system is taken to be something else called the heliopause, which is where the sun's solar wind merges into the interstellar medium. And that is a lot closer in. It's as close as 90 AU in some areas. It's not a totally spherical shape. So by some definitions, the Voyager spacecraft have already entered interstellar space because they have both crossed the heliopause back in 2012 and 2018. But they would have to travel another 300 years just to reach the Oort cloud. And that's only the inner edge. To travel through it and out the other side would be another 30,000 years. Just to give you a little bit of the sense of scale here. Okay, now I must correct myself here a little bit because I called the Oort cloud a cloud of comets, but what I should have said is that it is a hypothetical cloud of comets. That's right, we've never actually directly seen the Oort cloud. However, we're pretty sure that it must exist thanks to the dynamics of the solar system and, more importantly, thanks to some wayward members of the Oort cloud. See, because the Oort cloud is so far out on the edges of the solar system, it can actually interact with things outside of the solar system. And sometimes those interactions can change the orbit of a comet and send it into the inner solar system where we see them as these beautiful long period comets. And we've actually recorded about 140 long period comets that we think come from the Oort cloud. So we are quite confident that the Oort cloud exists, but no, we have not ever seen a comet actually in the Oort cloud because they are just too small and far away to be detected by any of our instruments. Okay, when it comes to the Oort cloud, we're gonna be talking a lot about orbits. So if you're not familiar with some of the properties of how we define an orbit, I encourage you to check out this video on Keplerian orbits. But just a quick recap, the semi-major axis is the long, half of the long axis of the ellipse that is the orbit. The eccentricity is basically how non-circular the orbit is. And the perihelion is the closest passage that the orbit makes to the sun, while aphelion is the farthest passage it makes from the sun. And inclination is how tilted the orbit is relative to some reference plane, which we will usually take to be the solar system's ecliptic. So given that we've never had the opportunity to see it, how did we even come to know that the Oort cloud does exist? So this is something we actually only learned in the 20th century. Well, let me apologize in advance that I probably can't say any of these names right. Okay, so back in 1907, this astronomer Leuschner proposes that these comets that we sometimes see passing through the inner solar system are actually on very long period elliptical orbits rather than hyperbolic orbits. So a hyperbolic orbit has an eccentricity greater than one, and it means that the comet is not bound to the sun. It's just gonna pass by and continue on its way. Whereas an elliptical orbit has an eccentricity less than one, and it means the comet is bound to the sun. It's gonna keep going around the sun in its orbit. And then in 1932, Opik theorizes about how long period comets and meteors could exist in the solar system and how they might interact with the surrounding galaxy. So then in 1950, we get this seminal paper from Jan Oort, and he proposes this cloud of comets that exist in the outer regions of the solar system and proposes a mechanism for how they came to be there. That's what we would now consider to be the outer region of the Oort cloud. In 1981, the astronomer Jack Hills proposes an inner region of the Oort cloud, which looks a little bit different. In 1987, we get this kind of comprehensive treatment of the formation of the Oort cloud, including from numerical simulations by Duncan Quinn and Tremaine. 
1993, we get Scott Tremaine predicting how Oort clouds could exist around other stars besides the Sun. Now these are just a few of the kind of big Oort cloud papers. I will link all of them below so you can read these scientific papers if you are so interested. And in fact, there's just going to be a ton of references linked below. <laughs> okay, so I've mentioned that the Oort cloud seems to have this inner region and this outer region. And the biggest difference between them is that the inner region is still basically a disk. It's a very puffy and thick disk, but it is not spherical. And it's closer in into the solar system. And then as you get out into these very outer regions, you start to get this spherical structure. And as we will come to see, this makes perfect sense. Okay, now here's where things start to get really interesting. How did we even come to have this sort of spherical shell of comets encircling the sun at such a great distance anyway? This is actually a fascinating story of dynamics, a subject very near and dear to my heart. Yes, it is what I basically did my PhD on. Not the Oort cloud, but just dynamics in general. Okay, so first things first, we know that these comets can't really form at such great distances from the sun. By looking at the composition of these long period comets, it seems to be a similar composition to the icy bodies that are in the inner solar system, which means they probably have some sort of common origin, which makes sense because we would expect these to be kind of leftover building blocks from the early solar system, so they basically all formed around the same time in the protoplanetary disk. However, the Sun's protoplanetary disk didn't extend out to 100,000 AU, and even if it had, as you go farther out in a protoplanetary disk, it becomes a little bit more difficult to build up bodies because the dust grains are moving slower, they don't collide as much, and as they build up, they tend to spiral inward pretty quickly. Now, I'm going to be saying inner solar system a lot, and when I say that in this video, I don't mean the inner solar system as in inwards of the astro belt, I mean the inner solar system as in inwards of the heliopause, basically. Okay, so if these comets seem to form in the inner solar system, how did they end up so far away? Usually, when we consider the solar system, we tend to think of it as an isolated unit, which makes perfect sense because the nearest star is over four light years away, and the sun's gravity basically dominates over the local solar environment just completely. But the solar system is not actually an isolated unit. It does exist within the larger environment of the galaxy. And the story of the Oort cloud is basically the story of that interaction with the rest of the galaxy. But it all starts in the inner solar system, where the comets form and where the planets are hanging out. When two objects with mass pass very close to one another, their gravity can have a really strong effect on the other, a kick, so to speak. And the more massive an object is, the more it kicks around other objects. Hmm, is there anything in the inner solar system that has a lot of mass? Jupiter? Saturn? Uranus? Neptune? Hmm? So all of these giant planets do a lot of kicking to these poor little comets. So the comets that are orbiting in the inner solar system keep getting kicked by all of these giant planets, and that alters their orbits in various kind of random ways. This process is called scattering, but remember the objects aren't actually physically touching one another, it's just their gravitational effects. So these planets and comets are moving around based on the force of gravity. And we already know that if you have three or more bodies moving around under gravity, we just cannot analytically, that is mathematically, write down exactly what's going to happen. But we've been thinking about the three-body problem for a long time, and there's a lot of approximations that have been come up with where we can actually kind of mathematically consider what is happening. One of these is a situation where you have a massive object and two other objects that are in orbit around it, so say the sun and a planet and a comet, and one of the two objects in orbit is much, much smaller than the other one, so the comet compared to a planet. Then we can consider the comet to basically have no mass at all. And so this is called the restricted three-body problem, because you're basically only giving two bodies mass and then you're restricting the third particle to have no mass at all. You can also further then say, okay, the planet is on a circular orbit to remove the effect of the planet's eccentricity, and then you get the restricted circular three-body problem, and we can actually write down some equations for that. And one way that this can be applied is when you have the smaller object scatter off the larger object, there's a certain quantity about its orbit that is conserved. And this is called the Tisserand relation. And yes, here it is. This is the one equation that I'm giving you in this whole video. But like I said, you don't have to do any math here. This is just to kind of give you an idea that there is this quantity you can consider being conserved for the comet. And if you look at the orbital elements that are present in this, you have the semi-major axis, A, the eccentricity, E, and the inclination, I. Okay, so let's go ahead and ignore the inclination for now. Let's just say it's all going to happen within one plane. Then if you look at this quantity, which has to stay the same before and after scattering, what happens to the orbital elements is that if A increases, E also has to increase. 
So I went ahead and calculated this for a comet that started on an orbit with an eccentricity of zero and a semi-major axis of 10. And you can see that as it gets scattered out to these higher semi-major axes, its eccentricity increases pretty significantly and it gets closer and closer to one. It basically asymptotically approaches one. This means that the comets can get put on these very, very large orbits with very high semi-major axes, but that also comes with a very, very high eccentricity which means that the perihelion is staying within the inner solar system. In fact, you can think of this entire scattering phase for the comet as being constant in perihelion. So A and E are changing always in such a way that the perihelion stays roughly the same. Which means that these comets have to keep passing through the inner solar system and basically running the scattering gauntlet every time they do so. And eventually the comets are just going to get such a kick from one of these planets that they're actually just totally ejected from the solar system. Their eccentricity is greater than one, they leave, they're never coming back. Eventually, the solar system should be completely cleared out of comets due to this process. And in fact, that's what led Jan Oort to his conclusion that the Oort cloud must exist, because the timescale on which the comets would just be totally gone from the solar system is actually pretty short compared to the age of the solar system. So the fact that we still see long period comets in the present day must mean that there is somewhere that they can safely exist for a long period of time in order for them to still even be around in the present day. But how? Based on what I've described, all of these comets would just get kicked out of the solar system. How do they end up in the Oort cloud? Aha! Now is when we get to bring in those external interactions. So when you have two objects orbiting a third object and interacting with one another, like we've talked about, there's energy and angular momentum conservation. So basically both of the objects can't both get ejected from scattering, and they basically cannot scatter themselves out of interacting with one another. So that goes back to the idea that the perihelion of the scattered comet is basically always going to be within the scattering region. But add in an external force, and now we've got ourselves a rodeo. Okay, so we know that these long period high eccentricity comets that are scattered off of the giant planets pass really close to the sun at perihelion, but they also have a really, really distant aphelion. For example, a comet that started at an orbit of 5 AU and zero eccentricity, if it got scattered onto an orbit with an eccentricity of 0.998, its perihelion would be 2.7 AU, and its aphelion would be almost 3000 AU. And because of Kepler's second law, we know that the comet is actually going to be spending a lot more time near aphelion than it is near perihelion. So these comets are spending an extremely long amount of time very far away from the sun. And sometimes other stars pass close enough to the sun that while those comets are hanging out in the far reaches of the solar system, they can get a little gravitational nudge from the passing stars. Now these nudges are very small and close passages of other stars are extremely rare, but because the comet is spending so much time, I mean, we're talking millions of years, these little nudges and perturbations really add up over time. And the cumulative effect of all of these random nudges over this long period of time is to basically diffuse all of the comet's orbits. So one of the ways that the comet's orbit might change is that its perihelion increases. So this means the comet no longer has to pass through the inner solar system and it's not at risk of getting scattered and ejected by those inner planets anymore. And so it can happily stay on a long period orbit out there. And these nudges from the passing stars are actually not the only thing to consider. There's actually the whole rest of the galaxy to take into account. See, the Milky Way has a ton of mass in it, and that creates this sort of background potential. And the mass is not perfectly uniformly distributed, which means you get tides. A galactic tide. <laughs> Now, an object has to be really far away from the sun in order to be able to feel the effects from the galactic tide, but lucky for us, that's exactly the region of the solar system that we are talking about. So the main effect of the galactic tide on the orbits of the comets is to change the angular momentum, which can basically either increase or decrease the perihelion of the comet. So again, these highly eccentric orbits can become circularized onto these new very long period orbits that are safe from additional planet interactions. In fact, while Oort only considered the effect of passing stars in his 1950 paper, Paper, it turns out that the effect of the galactic tide seems to be even more important in shaping and forming the Oort cloud. Okay, so I've explained how we can end up with these long period comets that don't interact with the planets anymore. But how did we start with a disk of comets and end up with a sphere? Okay, so before we looked at the Tisserand criteria, I said ignore the inclination. But what happens if we don't ignore the inclination? Well, if you work through the math, which again, you don't have to do, but I'm just telling you, you could if you wanted to, you would see that there's actually a limited range of inclinations that allows the Tisserand relation to actually stay constant before and after scattering. Meaning that these scattered comets actually stay roughly in a disk-like region. Now, granted, it's a puffier disk, so there's more variation in inclinations, but it's not spherical. 
So this is actually why the inner region of the Oort cloud is more disk-like. That inner region is kind of a transition area between the scattered disk, which is the scattered objects from, say, the Kuiper belt, and this spherical outer region of the Oort cloud. But for the same reason that these external perturbations can change the eccentricity and perihelion of these scattered comets, they can also have an effect on the inclination. And all of these perturbations are random. They can happen in any direction, which means the inclination can be changed in any direction, which eventually leads to these orbits forming a sphere because there's no preferential inclination anymore. And so that is how you end up with the spherical outer region of the Oort cloud, but you still have this almost disk-like puffy inner region where the orbits of those comets just have not quite diffused out yet into the spherical shape. Now we've seen how considering a mathematical approximation can help us have an intellectual understanding of what's happening here, but basically all of these things that we've talked about, the scattering, the perturbations, the galactic type, this is all random. And that means the best way to investigate this is actually with numerical simulations. So we can actually simulate this process from start to finish and see if we can actually start with comets in the inner region and then disk with the rest of the solar system and end up with a spherical Oort cloud in the outer region. And the answer is yes. <laughs> but it's important to note that ending up in the Oort cloud is only one possible outcome for these comets. At every step of the way, something else could happen to them. They could get ejected by scattering off of the planets. Some of the interactions with passing stars could disturb them above the escape velocity and they could also then eject themselves from the solar system. They could be stripped by the galactic tide away from the solar system. So there's always all these comets going off and doing other things and only a small fraction of them actually end up in the Oort cloud. In fact, depending on how efficient this process is at forming an Oort cloud from comets from the inner solar system, you might have to consider another source of Oort cloud comets to explain the density that we think the Oort cloud has. And that is capturing comets from other stars in interstellar space. See, just like our solar system is constantly ejecting some of these comets out into space, so are other solar systems. And then those comets could be captured when they pass too close to the solar system and they could mingle with comets that started within the inner solar system and they could both together be a source for creating the Oort cloud. So once these comets get perturbed onto these orbits in the Oort cloud, those external perturbations don't just go away. They're still acting on all of the comets that are in the Oort cloud. And those perturbations can cause those comets to be lost or they can send them back into the inner solar system. And this is how we sometimes get to see these beautiful long period comets in our skies and how we get to study them and help us learn more about the Oort cloud. Now you may be wondering, Nora, if all of this can happen to comets, can it also happen to planets? And I'm glad you asked because actually the very first paper of my PhD was on this topic. Now we think that this first stage, the scattering, is actually very common in young planetary systems. These planets form and they scatter off one another until they kind of reach a stable architecture. Now the scattering between planets is not exactly the same because now you've kind of got two objects of roughly equal mass instead of, you know, a little tiny comet and a planet, but the same idea applies. So you could definitely end up with a planet that had this, you know, very highly eccentric, high semi-major axis orbit that could interact with, say, passing stars when it's near Apple Center. So the key aspect here is actually the timing, because you really need a strong, near, close flyby from a star to lift the perihelion of the planet enough to keep it safe from future scattering and to keep it from getting ejected. So we simulated this in our paper and we found that it was indeed possible, but it happened at a relatively low rate and that rate decreased with the mass of the planet increasing. This is basically just because the more massive planets, they scatter more quickly, they eject more quickly, the timing is just such a short window for a star to fly by and save the planet, so to speak. So these types of Oort planets might exist. Indeed, this is one of the proposed formation mechanisms for the dwarf planet Sedna or for the hypothetical planet nine in our own solar system. However, it doesn't really seem like a good way to explain the wide orbit exoplanets that we have observed because most of those are very massive. Okay, but now I'm really going down the rabbit hole, so I will spare you any further details here, but you can check out my paper if you're interested. Okay, we've talked a lot about how comets can end up in the Oort cloud, so let me just quickly summarize. Comets scatter off the planets. Some of them end up on these highly eccentric long period orbits that they can then interact with external gravity sources like passing stars or the galactic tide. And then some of them can end up then on low eccentricity long period orbits that are stable for basically the age of the solar system. Okay, so that's our solar system and our Oort cloud. But do other stars also have Oort clouds? Almost certainly. So just like the basic facts of dynamics lead us to believe that there's this process happening in our own solar system that forms the Oort cloud, well, gravity is the same for other stars, and so they should also be able to have this process and form their own Oort clouds. 
However, given the complex interplay of dynamics here, there's a lot of things that can affect it, like the mass of the star, the density of other stars near that star, the planets of that star, or the age of the star. And since the planets are so important in the scattering process that eventually leads to the Oort cloud, what you can do is for a given set of stellar parameters, you could look at what kind of planets it would have to have in order to create an Oort cloud like ours. This was done in this paper back in 1993, and you can see here what this looks like for our solar system. And actually, what you'll notice from this is that Uranus and Neptune are really the planets that make it possible for us to have an Oort cloud. And this is actually just because Jupiter and Saturn are so massive that they just too quickly kick all the comets out of the solar system. But you can make the same plot for stars with different properties. So for example, this is what that plot would look like for a typical halo star in the Milky Way. Now keep in mind, this paper was from 1993, so literally the only exoplanets we knew of were a weird planetary system around a pulsar. So we can actually update this and look at a newer paper that actually has some real exoplanet data that we can put into it. So here is a similar figure from a 2017 study. So this is looking at a star with properties like the suns and comparing it to the known exoplanet population. And you can see here that the region where Uranus and Neptune are, which are so important to forming the Oort cloud, is actually just a region where we don't have very much information yet about what the exoplanet population looks like. So there's definitely a range of possible stars plus planets that could produce Oort clouds. However, it's a somewhat restricted range, so it could be that exo-Oort clouds are actually rather rare. And we have not been able to detect any structures like this around other stars. Things that are really small are hard to detect, and things that are really far from the star are really hard to detect. So basically, Oort clouds are like a detection <laughs> nightmare. <laughs> Astronomers have been proposing some ideas of methods we might be able to use to look for Oort clouds in other systems, but none of them are really practical yet. For example, one study in 2018 used data from probing the cosmic microwave background to actually look for exo or clouds. What they did is they looked for extended sources, that is not a point source, but extended sources of very cold temperatures, around 10 Kelvin, that existed at the same place as gnome stars. Now they didn't find any smoking guns of exo or clouds, but it was a proof of concept, and I think that future CMB mission data might be able to do this even better. So hopefully someday we may be able to spot an Oort cloud somewhere. <laughs> well, y'all, I think we've probably had our fill of the Oort cloud for today, but thank you so much for coming along on this deep dive with me. It was super fun to be able to just freaking nerd out. Love it. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, please consider subscribing and liking and sharing with all your cool friends who are also space nerds. <laughs> we love it here. <laughs> and I will see you again soon. Have a good one. Bye.